The original Intel i9 CPU for desktop was the 9900K. Back in 2018, this 8 core behemoth with 16 megs of L3 cache and boost speeds up to 5 gigahertz was the definition of overkill the ultimate gaming and productivity processor and one whose performance should still stand up five years later. The CPU I'm reviewing today is just like it. Kinda. Boiled down to its simplest attributes, the E52667V4 is an 8 core 16 thread CPU. It's built on the 14 nanometer process node. It uses DDR4 RAM. In these ways, it is exactly like the flagship desktop CPU that would be released two years later. And yet, this Xeon only costs a fraction of the price on the used market in 2023. Of course, I haven't discovered a secret life hack. I'm a Brit, but I'm not that spiffing. The E52667V4 is a Broadwell E-based CPU for Socket 2011 V3. Sure, it has a higher TDP and way bigger L3 cache than the first i9, and it supports quad-channel RAM, but that's where the good news ends. The first generation 14 nanometer chips for the X99 platform weren't anywhere nearly as refined as the later Coffee Lakes, and so clock speeds are far from comparable. The Broadwell Xeons, in fact, don't even have any of the performance hacks that the previous versions did. No flaw in the microcode to allow secret all-core boosts, and certainly no multiplier overclocking. The all-core maximum boost is just 3.5 GHz, about 70% of the first of the i9 processors. While its 8 cores and hefty 25 megabyte cache should still lend itself to productivity and general computing, any task that benefits from high clock speeds will reveal the E52667V4 to be a hollow pretender to the 9900K's throne. Tasks like, for example, gaming. But let's not dwell on what it isn't. What it is, is a CPU based on a relatively modern architecture that can be had for as little as £40 and that can fit into a range of cheap, if slightly suspect, motherboards from sites like AliExpress. And this makes it interesting. To see exactly how interesting, I paired it with 32 gigs of quad-channel DDR4 2400 and a gigabyte RTX 3070. You may notice throughout the video that the afterburner overlay seems to think this CPU is incredibly efficient, but this seems to be a bug with my motherboard and Broadwell processors. I measured about 175 watts total system consumption during the Cinebench R23 run and over 300 watts during gaming. With the CPU and GPU both artificially loaded down with combustor, the peak draw came to over 425 watts. Valorant doesn't always perform best on high core count CPUs. I've seen evidence in the past that suggests there might be a benefit to actually turning off hyperthreading and SMT, yet the 2667v4 does really quite well here. Its 3 match average of 277 FPS matches that of the Broadwell i7-5775C and actually beats the i7-6800K, a higher clocked 6 core which has significantly less cache. It doesn't quite reach the heights of the socket's best CPUs, the i7-5960X still beats it by 20%, and although I've yet to try the other Broadwell E i7s, I dare say there's plenty of potential there. It's interesting to see how far 8-core CPUs came from the Sandy Bridge era through Broadwell, and Battlefield 5 shows this quite well. The 144 FPS average from three matches, as well as being quite perfect for a lot of high refresh displays, is slightly above the highly overclocked E5 1680v2 and almost 50% higher than the lesser clocked E5 2670. Considering this game's preference for architectures more recent than Ivy Bridge, this isn't a complete surprise, and we're still a good 20% removed from the i7-5960X. I'm still none the wiser about what specific attributes make for a good Fortnite CPU, but this is pretty decent. 
at 228 FPS on average, the E5 2667 V4 is in the same company as the i7 7700 and way above 1st Gen Ryzen. In fact, this is three games straight in which the admittedly once very expensive Xeon beats the former 8-core budget king from AMD. But not four. The 2016 Xeon pretty much perfectly matches the slightly higher clocked Ryzen from 2017 in Microsoft Flight Simulator, in that it's quite disappointing. At the high-end preset with DLSS quality enabled, this store brand i9 can only manage 40 FPS with dips below 30. Of course, this isn't the end of the world for Flight Sim fans as they're not quite so demanding of high FPS as some genres but there are cheaper, older i7s on the same socket that can push up to 10 FPS higher. It's a mixed bag in Spider-Man Remastered. The non-RT run is pretty spectacular, so if you want to pair this with a GTX 1080 Ti, RX 5700 XT, or similar performing GPU that doesn't support hardware ray tracing, you can expect a hefty 97 FPS average. It's still a good 20-30% short of more modern Zen 2 and 3 CPUs, but considering its price and age, this isn't bad news at all. No, that comes from the RT-enabled run. The 2667v4's 52fps average still isn't unplayable, but it is one of the slowest 8 cores and, again, falls well behind its socket mates, including the far cheaper and overclocked i7-5930K. The Xeon remains capable and competitive in Cyberpunk, but again, is at its best when not using ray tracing. At 1440 Ultra with quality DLSS, I was one frame short of a diabolical coincidence at 65.6 FPS on average. Dropping to the medium preset and DLSS balanced barely affects the frame rate, showing that the game is being CPU limited even in more GPU demanding scenarios. With RT enabled and DLSS at balanced, the average FPS drops below 50, still above the Ryzen 1700 but well short of some of the other X99 i7s I've tested. The i7-5960X might require overclocking to 4.5GHz and therefore drinks power like a fish, but it's also only about £25-35 to pounds more expensive and can match far newer CPUs in many AAA games. Red Dead Redemption 2 has proven itself to be somewhat biased towards Intel CPUs, so it's no great surprise to see the 2667v4 beat some far newer and higher clocked Ryzen's here, but among the Intel competition, it's not looking too grand. The i7-5930K, which is a couple of years older, a couple of cores lighter, and now less than half the price, can get 10 FPS higher here, and 1% lows were dramatically healthier. While this 8-core is better on average than any of the quad cores I've tested so far, its minimums actually make it less appealing than the KB Lake i7-7700 or Broadwell i7-5775C. Bearing in mind that I didn't get round to testing The Witcher 3 on some of the better 2011 V3 chips I've owned in the past, it may be faint praise to say that the E5 2667v4 is one of the best CPUs I've tested in this title yet. It sits a little above the 6-core i7-6800K of this same generation, and a little below the Ryzen 7 4700G. While I suspect the Haswell E and Broadwell E i7s of this socket will do somewhat better in this title, this is still pretty impressive and is great for a 60fps experience. Finally, the no-holds-barred deathmatch thriller of Civilization VI's AI benchmark completes in 7.04 seconds, putting the Broadwell EZ on slap bang in the middle of the table. Right there with the Ryzen 1700, funnily enough.
So I haven't tested a real i9 before, and it appears that, after today, I still haven't. The first gen i9s from the Coffee Lake generation are still a little too rich for my blood, especially given how cheaply one can pick up a Ryzen 5700X nowadays, and quite honestly, I'm not sure the i9-9900K has a place on the market today. The E5 2667V4 is 1.5GHz lower clocked, and no amount of L3 cache or quad channel RAM can make up for that, but at a quarter of the price, there's still some merit here. I'm not sure it's the CPU I'd buy for X99, but if you don't have an overclocking motherboard or are looking for a good gaming upgrade for a Dell Precision workstation or similar, then there are worse options out there. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.